Hey guys, Dylan Schumacher, Citadel Defense, and today we're going to talk about the Second Amendment and what it means. So we're going to go through three uh, P's on the Second Amendment here. We're going to go through the purpose of the Second Amendment, the prominence of the Second Amendment, and the pros of the Second Amendment. So uh, first of all, the Second Amendment, right? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of the free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So what is, what is the purpose of that amendment? Why was it put in there? Uh, the purpose, which, you know, to be fair, I, I make fun of people for not knowing this, but to be fair, I don't think I knew this until I was an adult and I started to uh, get into guns and understand liberty a bit more. But the purpose of the Second Amendment is not to preserve the right to hunt geese or ducks or deer or whatever animal you want to hunt, which is a very valid and wonderful pastime that I don't participate in, but you can. The purpose is not to protect yourself from, from, from a street robber or a home invasion, although I own guns for that very purpose and I carry guns for that very purpose. The purpose of the Second Amendment is to protect the, necess it's necessary for the security of the free state, right? The purpose of the Second Amendment is to protect the people and to protect their liberties and rights. That is the purpose of the Second Amendment. The, the Founding Fathers envisioned a people uh, that were armed to the teeth and able to fight wars in order that, if they needed to, they could arise to forcibly defend their liberty from foreign invasions, uh, an enemy's foreign and domestic, right? That, that's, that's how we look at it. So from a foreign invasion, right? Which again, if you want to invade America, good luck. Uh, you got to get through those 19 aircraft carriers and then you actually have to land on America where we have more guns than people. So come on over, the water's just fine. Um, which is nice, I, I like being able to say that. I like being able to brag that any country will have a very fun time invading America. And uh, enemies domestic, right? So that if tyranny was ever to arise within our own ranks, that the people would have a means of defending themselves from said tyranny. Uh, the people who wrote this amendment, people who wrote the Constitution, just got done fighting a war for give or take eight years. Uh, my math isn't uh, exact on that one, so I apologize. So obviously they didn't want to go through that again, and they only won that war because the people themselves were armed and continued to arm themselves throughout the conflict. And that is one of the ways, of course, which you win wars. It's very hard to win wars when you're not armed. So that's the purpose of the Second Amendment. Now, I'm just going to read you a couple of my favorite juicier quotes uh, of the Founding Fathers on the Second Amendment. I will post the link to where I'm pulling these from below in the description, and you're, of course, more than welcome to go read all of them. However, I'm just going to pick out some of them. The Constitution of most of our states and of the United States asserts that all power is inherent in the people, that they may exercise it by themselves, that it is their right and duty to be at all times armed. Thomas Jefferson, letter to John Cartwright, 5th of June, 1824. A strong body makes the mind strong. As to the species of exercise, I advise the gun. While this gives moderate exercise to the body, it gives boldness, enterprise, and independence to the mind. Games played with the ball and others of that nature are too violent for the body and stamp no character on the mind. Let your gun, therefore, be your constant companion of your walks. Thomas Jefferson, letter to Paul Carr, August 19th, 1785. No free man shall ever be debarred the use of arms. Thomas Jefferson, Virginia Constitution, Draft 1, 1776. A free people ought not only to be armed, but disciplined. George Washington, First Annual Address of Both Houses of Congress, January 8, 1790. I ask, who are the militia? They consist now of the whole people, except a few public officers. George Mason, Address to Virginia Ratifying Convention, June 4th, 1788. Before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed, as they are in almost every country in Europe. The supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword, because the whole body of the people are armed, and constitute a force superior 
to any band of regular troops. Noah Webster, the guy who, Noah Webster Dictionary, an examination of the leading principles of the federal constitution, October 10th, 1787. Besides the advantage of being armed, which the Americans possess over the people of almost every other nation, the existence of a subordinate government to which the people are attached and by which the militia officers are appointed forms a barrier against the enterprises of ambition more insurmountable than any which a simple government of any form can admit of. James Madison, Federalist Paper Number 46, January 29th, 1788. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the best and most natural defense of a free country. James Madison, First Annals of Congress, 434, January 8th, 1789. Necessity is the plea for every infringement of human freedom. It is the argument of tyrants. It is the creed of slaves. William Pitt the Younger, speech in the House of Commons, November 18th, 1783. That one has more to do with uh, the encroachment on your rights than outright guns, to be fair, but it was cool. I wanted to include it in here anyway. A militia, when properly formed, are in fact the people themselves and include, according to the past and the general usage of the states, all men capable of bearing arms. To preserve liberty, it is essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms and be taught alike, especially when young, how to use them. Richard Henry Lee, former farmer, number 18, January 25th, 1788. Guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunately, unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. Whenever you give up that force, you are ruined. The great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able might have a gun. Patrick Henry, speech to the Virginia Ratifying Convention, June 5th, 1778. The Constitution shall never be construed to prevent the people of the United States, who are peaceable citizens, from keeping their own arms. Samuel Adams, Massachusetts Ratifying Convention, 1788. So, I could go on and read more of those. Again, I'm going to post that link below. But I don't want to read them all here. I think you get the point. It's pretty clear that the purpose of the Second Amendment is that people should always be armed and that they should do so in the defense of their liberties. Okay? Second, prominence. So, when I say prominence, I mean its placement in the Bill of Rights. The Second Amendment is the Second Amendment because it's, you got it, second in the order. Therefore, it is the second most important thing that the founders of this nation wish to impart to us. The first most important thing, of course, is the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of religion, which is our defining principle. You go anywhere else in the world and nobody has that like we do. Uh, people will say, oh, well, they have freedom of speech in other countries. No, they don't. Uh, they certainly don't have it to the degree that we have it. And most, I know of no other place in the world that has freedom of speech. If you would like to argue about that, please leave a comment and we can find where they have hate speech laws. The prominence of the Second Amendment is especially important because people will say, well, we don't need that anymore. We've outgrown it. It's not that important, etc., etc., etc. However, it was the second most important principle of our government. The second most important founding principle of our government is that we, the people, should have, keep, and bear arms. Think about that for a second. This, this was important. You're writing the founding document of a country and you're going to make some changes to it right after it's ratified. And the second thing that, you can, that everybody agrees on, that wholeheartedly no one argues with, is that everybody needs to be armed. Uh, that's significant. That should strike us in a very important way. Our government today obviously would never be able to agree on anything uh, to that nature, right? Forget guns, just, just anything. There, we'd be split left and right, center, all, all the way through. But all these people just got done fighting a war for their independence, and they all agreed that, yeah, we should keep our guns. I, I think that's a significant thing. This is not some side project that they had. This is not a simple idea that they said, oh, well, you know, maybe we can just throw this in. No, this was the second most important principle of government for the people who made this country. 
and it's easy to lose sight of that, especially because we don't treat the other amendments like we treat the Second Amendment. And what I mean by that is, the amendment that says shall not be infringed, which we're going to get to that in a minute, is of course the most infringed amendment in our current uh, state government. That the, the, currently, the way the, the government of the United States runs, the right that is trampled on the most, by far, is the Second Amendment. I would argue that the one that is uh, trampled on uh, maybe a, a strong rival will be the Fourth Amendment. That would be the, the next one that's trampled on. However, the Second Amendment, I would argue by far, is trampled on the most. And I can point to several different laws and gun control acts to prove that point. So that's prominence. It, it's a very important thing. It was a very important thing in the Founding Fathers' minds. And it should be a very important thing in our minds as free Americans. If we wish to maintain that liberty, we need to understand the purpose of the Second Amendment and therefore give it its proper prominence. I'm not arguing for more prominence than it deserves. I'm not putting it above the First Amendment. I am putting it in its proper prominence as the second most important thing in the Constitution. Furthermore, it is the thing that protects the rest of the Constitution. One of the quotes I read you, of course, talked about the people needing to defend themselves. And the only way you can do that sometimes is by force. The only way to preserve your liberty sometimes is by force. And that's, of course, why we were given and why we were entrusted with and why we must keep and protect and cherish our Second Amendment. Because without it, we have none of the other rights. Lastly, of course, is the prose. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, that of course means language, right? So the, the language structure. So we're going to go through and note a couple key words in the Second Amendment. Now, the first one we're going to note is well-regulated. A well-regulated militia. People like to argue about what this term means. They will say things, of course, like it means regulation. And I can understand how some people can come to that conclusion. However, that's a pretty historically lazy way to interpret that, considering the time it was written in. Uh, well regulated there does not mean laws against guns. It can't possibly mean that, because the second half says, shall not be infringed. We'll get there in a minute. Well regulated means orderly, in good working order. Uh, that things are going to work and, and are organized, disciplined. That's what well regulated means. I would like to read you from Federalist Paper Number 29 by Alexander Hamilton. Uh, it requires no skill in the science of war to discern that uniformity in the organization and discipline of the militia would be attended to with the most beneficial effects wherever they are called into service for the public defense. It would enable them to discharge the duties of the camp and of the field with mutual intelligence and concert, an advantage of peculiar moment in the operations of an army. For those of you who don't understand 300-year-old English, the people need to know what they're doing. They need to have it there. They need to have it together. They're ducks in a row, and they need to be organized. That's well-regulated. That's what they're saying when they say well-regulated militia. It does not mean that there are laws that can be passed to restrict guns. We know that especially because of the second part, which we're going to get to. The second part I would like to talk about is the word militia. Now, unfortunately, in our current time, that's become a dirty word, right? It usually means some kind of right-wing psycho group. That's what a militia means. Uh, unfortunately, we've kind of lost the heritage of that word a little bit. And the Founding Fathers did not believe in a standing army. They thought it was dangerous to liberty. Think on that for a second, considering we have the largest military in the world by far. Uh, so. The Founding Fathers thought a standing army was dangerous to liberty, and therefore they wanted to have a militia. Militias were state, by the, at the state level, groups of people, ordinary citizens, you mean everybody else, who would get together in time of need to form a fighting force in order to do and defend and fight what they had to do. That was the idea behind a militia. Like I said, unfortunately we've lost the meaning of that word and people kind of look at it as this backward thing that shouldn't exist anymore and we don't need it and we've outgrown it and all these other things because we somehow think that we're not humans anymore with defects and sin and that we've somehow evolved past that and are able to be better than that. This of course is a simple idea that it does not match well with reality. So I think we need to understand the word militia and understand that the idea there was a group of people, ordinary 
everyday citizens who are called in to be a fighting force when needed, and they were well regulated, meaning that they trained regularly together, meaning they drilled regularly together, meaning that they understood how to use their weapons effectively so that they could go out on the battlefield and do what they needed to do and win and come back home and farm their cabbage or cobble their shoes or do whatever it was that was their normal full-time job. Our next word here is necessary. Notice that they considered it necessary. A militia, a, a well-regulated militia, wasn't something that was a nice to have or a good to have. It was something they considered as necessary to, to the security of the free state. In order to keep the state free, you have to have a well-regulated militia. It's not something that was a nice to have or a maybe. If we don't have this, we won't have a free state. Again, think about that because we've lost the heritage of militia and our freedom has certainly declined since we became the sole superpower in the world, excuse me. And our freedom has certainly declined since we've become the superpower in the world following World War II and the rise of the state and the spy organizations and all the government welfare programs and on and on and on. As that has risen and government power and influence has risen, of course, our rights have decreased. And one of the things that we lost in there, of course, was the militia because we've no longer considered it necessary. However, the Founding Fathers considered a militia, a well-regulated militia, necessary in order to maintain a free state. Security. The word security here obviously means that if we need to keep it secure, right? It's something that needs to be protected. Liberty is a concept that needs to be protected and is not something that should be taken for granted. So it is necessary to have a well-regulated militia for the security, something that is to be protected and cherished, not something that should be taken for granted. The free state. Obviously they didn't get done fighting a war, a very long, brutal, difficult conflict to come up with a not free state. The idea of freedom and liberty was very prominent in the minds of the people who wrote the Constitution, who founded this country, who served as its first order of presidents and congresspeople and senators. Liberty and the idea of a free state was prominent in their minds. They of course did not envision uh, some kind of anarchist dystopia like so many of us have fallen into these days to think that somehow anarchy would be better. Anarchy would not be better. It's a terrible idea and you should get rid of it. However, the idea of a free state is a fantastic one and we should work towards that end. The right of the people. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Notice that the right is tied to the people. The right is not tied to the militia. Someone could come back and say, well, you know, you're not a member of the militia, which again, the militia includes everybody who could bear arms. If you look at those quotes down below in the link, you'll find that. But that aside, the right of the people, it, the right does not belong to, you have to be in a militia, you'd have to be whatever. The right belongs to the people, the people at large. The right of the people to keep and bear arms. Notice also that it's a right. The, the Founding Fathers considered rights inherent in your humanity, meaning that your rights came from God and they did not come from anything else. Uh, most of the Founding Fathers, some of the Founding Fathers were Christians, most were not. Uh, most and all that I can think of were at least theists, meaning they believed in a God or a higher being outside of themselves and therefore they received things, rights, because of their humanity that came from something outside of them. A government does not grant rights. That idea, of course, is found nowhere in the founding documents or the minds of the people who founded this nation. Rather, our rights come, they're external, they're imputed to us, right? Rights come from God. Because you're human, because you're made in God's image, you therefore have a certain degree of rights. That is an idea, of course, that is inherent in all of the founding documents. So it's a right that was invested in the people that they have and that this document, this amendment, this document secures. It does not make it, it does not provide it, it rather secures what you already have. So it is the right of the people inherent within them. Keep. I take this one up, I take this word up and I point it out particularly because we are allowed to keep arms. Meaning you can have whatever kind of gun you want. That's what that means. Now, with the rise of gun control, particularly since the NFA Act in 1934, I believe, there have been less arms we are allowed to keep. 
right? There are certain arms in this country, especially if you go to states like California or New York or New Jersey, where you are not allowed to keep arms of any kind. If I were to go into New Jersey, uh, I would be an instant felon because of the arms that I am currently keeping. Just being in possession of them would make me a felon. Clearly a violation of my constitutional right, but again, no right is trampled on as much as the Second Amendment right. So we have the right to keep arms. That means in your house, uh, on your person, we're gonna get to that in a minute, but you have the right to keep arms, to keep whatever kind of arms you want. Bear. Bear, of course, means to bear in one's person. Uh, for example, there was a law in New York they recently withdrew because it was gonna get challenged in the Supreme Court, and I think it's going there anyway, that said, unless you're taking your gun directly to a gun range to shoot it, you are not allowed to take your gun outside your home. This, of course, would encroach on your right to bear arms. When the founding fathers said keep and bear arms, they meant to keep whatever guns you want, of course, and then be able to bear them, which means to carry them on your person. Now, I think we're up to 11 states in this country that have constitutional carry. They call it constitutional carry because it's in line with the Constitution. They, which constitutional carry means is you can just strap up and go. You can put your gun on, you can keep and bear arms, and you don't need to ask anyone's permission, which is exactly what this amendment means. The Second Amendment is my permit. I'm sure we've all heard that. And yes, it's kind of funny. However, it's also true. We have the right to keep and bear arms, meaning you can carry your gun and you should not need a permit. You shouldn't need a background check. You shouldn't need any of that because this doesn't mention any of that. It mentions you have the right to keep and bear arms. So when certain states will say you can't open carry or you can't carry this type of gun or whatever, that is of course contrary to what we're allowed to do, which is keep and bear arms. Everyone's favorite part, shall not be infringed. By this point, of course, you've garnered that it means exactly what it says it means. It means it shall not be infringed. There are, should be no laws made to infringe upon your rights to keep and bear arms because those arms are necessary to keep the state free and that's why we have a well-regulated militia. It's the Second Amendment in reverse for you. All gun control laws are unconstitutional because any gun control law necessarily infringes on your right. That's why they're called gun control laws. So we don't need to be enamored or, or lulled to sleep with terms like common sense gun safety because what these laws, of course, mean is that they are going to restrict and infringe upon your current rights. People, of course, will say things like, I love the Second Amendment, but, or we can pass these laws and not infringe on anyone's rights. This, of course, is not true. The necessity of passing the law is infringing on your rights because it will therefore restrict your right to keep and bear arms and ultimately, and this is the key point, make you less safe. This whole Second Amendment exists to protect your freedoms and your liberties. Our civil liberties keep us safe. If we lose our right and if our right is infringed upon, we become less safe. That's important because of course the play that they make is we need to pass these laws so that you can be safe. However, we are safe right now having the laws that we have. Your law will actually make us less safe. So that's it guys, that is the second amendment as I read it and as I break it down. I put this out here because I think it's important to have a really firm understanding of what the second amendment says and why it says what it says so that when we hear unconstitutional laws or when we hear things that of course don't make sense, we're able to refute that in a reasonable and reasoned manner. This is our liberty, this is our right that has been entrusted to us to protect, so let's protect it. Do brave deeds and endure.